All right, good evening, everybody. Good to be with you once again in our devotion through the book of Nehemiah. Now, I confess to you, we're not really going through the entire book of Nehemiah. I certainly am looking forward to someday in the near future uh, being able to do an exhaustive study through this amazing book. Um, but tonight, we're actually going to go back to chapter 2 again. Because yesterday, we began studying Nehemiah in chapter 2, and our focus was Nehemiah as a man of action. He was a man who was involved, and the challenge for us was make sure we're involved, involved in the Christian life, involved in one another's life, involved uh, in our church, the local body of Christ. Now, that followed our study of Nehemiah in chapter 1 as a man of prayer. But today, what we're going to do is look at chapter 2 again, and we're going to find Nehemiah as a man who withstood his enemies. He withstood opposition. Now, certainly, this is going to be a valuable lesson for any Christian, as there's no question about it that we most certainly face enemies in our life. Uh, as a matter of fact, let's start off with that question. What enemies, what opposition do we face in the Christian life? What, what opposition do we face um, uh, when, when we're trying to seek a life, to live a life that is pleasing to the Lord and in service for Him? I mean, I, the three big ones come to mind, right? Our flesh certainly is an opposition to us growing and walking with the Lord. Uh, this world and this world system is in opposition to our living for the Lord and proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ. And without a doubt, uh, that great deceiver, the devil, Satan, stands in opposition. Now, as we get background here in chapter number two, there's really not a great deal known about the specific individuals who oppose Nehemiah. Now, if you downloaded the notes ahead of time and read through the chapter and read through the portions of scripture that I ask you to, you've identified three people in verse 10 of chapter 2 and verse 19 of chapter 2, three specific people. And we'll just examine it just for a moment. The origin of the opposition comes from these three people. We have Sanballat, the Horonite, Tobiah, the Ammonite, and then in verse 19, we read about Geshem, the Arabian. Now, most likely, these are all individuals who either moved to or had been planted there in Jerusalem or near Jerusalem in, in uh, Judah after the captivity. If you recall your history of Israel when they were defeated by the Assyrians, um, what the Assyrians did was then they took Israelites captive. Of course, some were left there, but then they brought people from other nations and planted them there. That's where we have the Samaritans, that region of Samaria. In, and Samaritan people are those people who have been transplanted from other regions into um, Israel. We think most likely this is, this is probably the case with these individuals as well, that once the people of Judah had been taken captive into Babylon years before, that uh, either people had moved to or had been placed there uh, in order really to keep it from being a land that was just re-inhabited by the Israelites. So regardless of their exact origin, we see in verse 10 of chapter 2 the occasion of their opposition. Let's look at it there. When Sambalot the Horonite and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, heard of it, it grieved them exceedingly that there was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. And so here is the occasion of the opposition. These men were grieved that somebody had come and was looking out for the condition of Israel and the welfare of the people of Israel. So the origin, we see the three specific individuals, the occasion, that they're grieved because there's somebody there watching over what was going on. As a matter of fact, if we think about them having been um, having lived there for some time, uh, obviously these had to be men of notoriety, and probably what they're upset about is their rule um, and somebody coming in that might threaten the rule that they had take that they had uh, that they had established there. But let's look here as we want to get to the meat of this and the objective. What was the object objective of the opposition? Look with me at verse number seventeen. Now this is after Nehemiah had taken survey 
of the city of Jerusalem, the walls that had been broken down. And if we look here at verse number 17, then said I unto them. So Nehemiah is coming now. He's talking to the priest, the nobles, the rulers there in Jerusalem. Then said I unto them, you see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem that we be no more a reproach. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. Now, what was the Nehemiah's objective? Well, Nehemiah's objective was to, let's get to work. Let's get the work done that needs to be done. Let's build up or rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. By the way, let's talk for a minute about what is the objective of the work of the church. Is it not to build up the body of Jesus Christ? Is it not this ministry of reconciliation and reaching the lost with the gospel of Jesus Christ? I mean, what a picture here. Nehemiah saw a great work that he believed needed to be done in rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. Boy, let us look out and see the great work that God has called us to. There, there's no greater work on earth that needs to be done than the building up of the body of Christ and the reaching the lot of the lost with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we, we, we look here and we see the objective of Nehemiah, but what about the objective of his enemy? Well, it's taken from the work that Nehemiah wanted to get done. They saw that now the walls would be built up. There's going to be protection over the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They're no longer going to have their way with them. So when we get to verse number 19, it says, When Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the servant the Ammonite, and Geshem the Arabian heard it, heard what? Heard that they were ready to get to work. They laughed us to scorn. They despised us and said, what is this thing that ye do? Will ye rebel against the king? Here's what their goal was. Here's what their objective was. It was to intimidate and to frustrate the workers and Nehemiah. They desired to do so by laughing at them. My, how, how, how many times have you been laughed at by unbelievers, by this world? As you take a stand for Jesus Christ, you refuse to... Uh, use the foul language or the crude and dirty humor that this world does. You try to proclaim the truth of God's word, the love of Jesus Christ, their need for salvation. How often are we laughed to scorn because of that? With the objective of frustrating the work that we're trying to do. They despise them and they falsely accuse them. Look there, it says, what is this thing you do? Will you rebel against the king? Well, they were rebelling against the king. Nehemiah had letters of authority from the king. Remember, we examined that um, uh, the last time we met here in chapter number two. And that's often the case of our enemies as well. They'll try to hurl false accusations against us, um, often talk about how we're hypocrites, and, and why? Because we're not perfect. So that's the objective of our enemies. So the parallels, again, Christian, are very, very clear. We have a great work to do, but there's also great opposition in the face of the work that we have to do. But what we want to note tonight in the last few moments that we have together is how did Nehemiah overcome the opposition? We saw its origins. We saw the occasion for it because the, the work was getting ready to get done. We saw the objective was to humiliate them, was to frustrate the work that needed to be done. How did Nehemiah overcome the opposition. This is a lesson for us, Christian, in overcoming opposition. First of all, it's all, and I think it's all found right here in verse number 20. So let's read verse 20, and then we'll go back. Uh, just a couple of simple thoughts, three simple thoughts from it. All right, then answered I them and said unto them, the God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore, we his servants will arise and build, but ye have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. All right, number one, Nehemiah recognized the sovereignty of God. He said, the God of heaven, he will prosper us. Can I remind you that if God be for us, who can be against us? 
There is no work that God has given us to do that he will not equip us to do. And and therefore, if it means that we're going to face opposition, God is going to take care of that opposition as well. Be strengthened in your hands, Christian. Be strengthened in the work that we've been called to do, whether that's our own growth in our personal walk with the Lord or being in service in the body of Christ. God is sovereign and he is sovereign even over the forces that oppose us. Number two, Nehemiah demonstrated his resolve to begin the work. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build. I'm not going to listen to you, you that come up in opposition against me. That's not going to cause me to not get to the work. Nehemiah was resolved, and man, how we need resolve. We need resolve in our daily walk with the Lord and just the work of being built up and rooted in Jesus Christ. We need to resolve to get to work through the body of Christ. Uh, maybe maybe that's been waning a little bit. Maybe the Lord's been urging you to step in and become involved somewhere. Maybe even as simple as some of the projects that need to be done around the church facilities. Maybe stepping in, doing work in the nursery and Sunday school, whatever the case may be. Let's be resolved that we're going to do the work that God has called us to. And then thirdly, he refused to give the enemy ground. Notice what he said. You have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. Christian, can I tell you this? Your flesh has no legitimate portion to you any longer. The Bible says that we are crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Um, We're a, we we are new creature, the old flesh, even though we struggle with it, it is in opposition to what God is trying to do in our lives. It has no legitimate portion. Say, say as Nehemiah did that, that ye have no portion nor right nor memorial in my life. Number two, um, as we think about that, not only our flesh has no legitimate portion over us, the world has no memorial in, in you. You're not of this world. The Bible says in the book of Colossians, our conversation is in heaven. We're simply travelers here. So don't let this world take over. Don't let this world and its opposition to you um, have a memorial in your life. And then finally, that old devil has absolutely no right to you whatsoever. We're a child of the king. And what a what a great lesson when it when we think about opposition and overcoming opposition. If there's an axiom of the Christian life relative to opposition, it might read something like this: Christian growth will always be opposed by somebody. But friend, we've seen that by following the example of Nehemiah, we can overcome opposition. The Bible says in Romans 8, 37, nay, in all these things, we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. So let's go forward this week, the opposition that we face, knowing that we can overcome that opposition through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thanks for tuning in. God bless you. Have a wonderful evening.